Welcome to our Minds and Money 5 at 5 show, which this week is sponsored by Libero Copper and Gold, Surge Copper, Orico Resources, and North Isle Copper and Gold, and is brought to you in association with Resource Global Network. For those of you who don't know, we started our first 5 at 5, 5 guests at 5 p.m. back in April 2020. We intended as originally as a stopgap 60 minute show, which would bring the industry together whilst we were dealing with lockdown and COVID-19. 20 months on, we are now on episode 97. Um, if you have any announcements before we start, um, to please have your video switched on. And to ask a question, you've got two options. You can either go and submit your questions in the chat function, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. You can also ask to be unmuted by waving your hands. Um, either myself or my colleague, Kelvin Johnson, will unmute you and you can get to ask your question live. Um, for today's show, we're focusing on a uh, commodity that everyone is very, very keen on these days, and it's copper. To discuss this, we have a great lineup of guests. They are Justin Machin, Director of Denham Capital Management, Martin French, Director of London Specialist Capital, Ian Harris, Chief Executive Officer of Libero Copper and Gold, Leif Nielsen, Chief Executive Officer of Surge Copper, Sam Lee, Chief Executive Officer of North Isle Copper and Gold, and Adam Smith, the Vice President of Business Development of Oracle Resources. Um, so very keen just to go and uh, get the ball rolling by having a polling question that I'm going to bring up onto the screen now, um, which the following is the main reason why you would invest in copper. Uh, give me a couple of choices there. Supply demand fundamentals, the green economy EV revolution, lack of tier one discoveries, supply chain disruption or something else. If it is something else, again, please feel free to go and post your comments in the chat, bo in the chat box function at the bottom of the screen. Um, whilst you're voting, let me turn to our, um, our two investor guests. Uh, let start off by going to Martin French. Just quite keen, how, how, you, how, how, would, how, how would you go and vote in that poll? Um, that's a good question. Well, I, I guess um, it's probably going to be the, the green economy EV revolution, because I think that's providing the incremental demand for copper. Um, although sort of, uh, you, you, you know, it's portion of the copper market or demand globally is only about 3% right now. Um, but if you look at the various kind of forecasts, consensus forecasts, it's going to rise to about 20% by 2030. Um, and it's that extra sort of demand that's going to cause the um, gap in supply demand um, in copper, which is probably going to be <clears throat> a driving force behind the copper price. So I'd say that's the main sort of catalyst for a robust copper market going forward. Sure. And, and bringing in Justin from Denham Capital, as an investor, what attracts you to copper? I think it's I think really it's this kind of supply demand uh, situation that's emerging, which is really a product of of all the things listed in this uh, in this uh, poll that you have in front of us. Um, I, I think with the energy transition theme and electrification, uh, we're going to see increased demand for copper uh, that is going and it's going to exacerbate a supply crunch that was coming anyways, which is resulting from. Uh, underinvestment in the sector over the last 10 years, uh, declining grades and declining mine lives across the space. Um, so we are kind of very bullish on copper as a long-term commodity, both both from an electrification perspective, but then also um, you know from future price increases as a result of uh, supply and demand uh, 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 crunches. And, and for viewers who aren't um, familiar with Denim Capital, at what sort of stage would you typically get involved in a, involved in a copper story? Would it be at the sort of early stage exploration, late stage development? And do you take us through a short term or more of a long term outlook? So our, our copper portfolio right now is actually really balanced. Uh, we have a, a producing mine in Chile uh, that is almost completed ramp up. Uh, we have a, a bankable feasibility stage development project in Chile that we're also going to be looking to, to finance and start construction on in the next six months. Uh, and then we have uh, an early stage exploration investment uh, where we control 19.9% uh, of a, a publicly listed explorer um, Camino Minerals. And that's a bit of a, a unique situation. They have a very interesting exploration portfolio um, that I think, you know, with two, two projects that I think will ultimately be very attractive for major miners. Um, 
but typically we would look to invest in later stage projects, you know, pre-feasibility stage and onwards. Mm -hmm. And uh, for yourself, Martin, I understand that you've made a number of recent investments and you're also involved. I think you're saying, I, I think I'm right in saying you're also the chairman of Chesterfield Resources. Um, yeah, that's right. So um, Chesterfield just bought, um, we're an exploration company. Uh, we've just bought a 300 square kilometre um, exploration play in Labrador in Canada um, through a, a, a royalty project generator called Autis Minerals, who are quite well known out there. Um, and uh, actually just kind of <clears throat> in line with what Justin was saying, it's, it's a project that's big enough uh, and suitable for a major to get involved in as an earning. Um, and that's why we went for it, because we think most of the majors are short um, of copper um, uh, exposure. Um, and they're going to be looking for these kind of places. It's actually one of the lack of tier one discoveries is one of the, the items on your poll. Um, so, uh, yeah, we bought that project uh, four months ago and uh, we're gearing up to drill it quite soon. OK, well, thank you very much for that. And I'll just bring the uh, 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 polling answer. Should, should we get to go and share it on the screen now? Uh, it's pretty even, actually. Uh, supply, supply demand fundamentals on 41 percent. Green economy EV revolution on 34% and you know, lack of tier one discoveries a little bit more behind on 15%. But I suspect for most of us, if you'd had the options to vote for all three, you kind of probably would have done. Um, I think with, with that, let's kind of move on to our first mining update. And again, this week, I'm really excited. We've got four fantastic um, copper projects to go and uh, talk about. And our first mining project we're gonna hear a bit more about, I'm gonna invite him to go and share his slides now, is Ian Harris, who's chief executive officer of Labera Copper and Gold. He's a mining engineer, 20 years experience leading mining projects worldwide, including over 10 years working and living in South America. Ian, very keen to learn more. Well, thank you very much. And I'll try and go over as much as possible in the short period of time I have, uh, because we, we have a lot on our plate. We have three significant projects, all that have the potential to be future open pit uh, porphyry tier one size mines. We have an excellent team. I wish I could dive into it, but I really would like to spend my time today uh, talking to about a project that's really close to my heart, which is which is Makoa, which is in in, in Colombia. And uh, you know, not just because it has a resource, uh, but also for other reasons. But it's a, a project that has an inferred resource of 636 million tons at a 0.49 equivalent copper, and already has spectacular holes in it that were drilled, last drilled by B2 Gold in 2012, acquired by Libero in 2018. Um, and we are now finally moving this project forward. The first uh, exploration has been done in, a, in, in, in 10 years, and I think it will be a pretty big, uh, important impact. Uh, it's close to me because 10 years ago, I was senior vice president and country manager at Corriente Resources and took the project Mirador all the way through to the start of construction and sale. And it went on to be the first large scale mining operation in the history of Ecuador. And it's right across the border in Colombia on the same Jurassic Porphyry belt. Um, so a lot of lessons learned in that time in Ecuador and, and applying it in, in Colombia, where I've been living since June, uh, because the project has significant legs and very similar story to we're in San Solaris, which was 50 kilometers north of, of the Mirador project, but historically drilled. Both companies came in, did a resource estimate, very similar size grade uh, resources. Uh, ours is larger, but the core is about the same grade as, uh, as the Warenza project, already has incredible holes in it, systematically drilled. They got their community agreements, did their geophysics, did their soil sampling, started drilling and obviously made an incredible uh, valuation improvement in the company in over 18 months. Where are we today? We now have our social license. We just finished geophysics. We'll be starting now uh, soil sampling and be following up very soon with, with drilling. Uh, and we think that we can follow a very similar path um, because if you look historically, it was drilled systematically by, by B2 Gold. Uh, we'll be able to go back through, confirm that historical drilling. You can see the core center of this project is over a thousand meters uh, of, a, of a very high grade core. And so with the time that I have, that's the, that's the most important thing that I wanted to share that the Makoa project now has restarted uh, and we'll be drilling on it in a very short period of time. And I think will be a, a major transformation of the company. Okay, um, well, thank you very much for that. I'm gonna kick off with the first question. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the sustainable social license work you're doing? Yeah, you know, so I think many times that's a, a question is a misnomer because it implies what kind of programs are you doing? What kind of nice things are you doing? What kind of schools are you building? 
And I think uh, the biggest things that we did and lessons learned from, from my time in Ecuador or any mast in, in Panama uh, was that the most important thing is, is listening, sharing everything before you, you do it. Before we did geophysics, we're out in every single community explaining what it is, what we're going to be doing and getting feedback. And one of the biggest feedback is, hey, we've had oil here before and all they care about is unskilled labor. We want the skilled labor. So the first thing that we did is, is got a group of three young geologists, hired them immediately and started training programs. We're looking at buying our own drills so we can have our own drill crews, everything to maximize uh, the skilled employment and, and incorporating training into our, into our work programs. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, and I'd like to bring in that to um, investor guests. Uh, Justin of Denim Capital, what questions do you have for Ian? Uh, thanks, Andrew. And, and building on the back of the kind of social license point, uh, is your project located in an ecologically sensitive area? I know that's created permitting challenges for other companies in Colombia in the recent past. Yeah, so we're in what's considered an intervened uh, forestry area, so it's not, you know, prime forest. Um, it is uh, near to the Amazon, so obviously we're extra sensitive uh, to environmental impacts, uh, but we don't foresee that this, this is about 10 kilometers from the town of Makoa, uh, so it's not an overly sensitive area, but it doesn't mean that we we don't keep it very high on our list on, on we, we basically operate on a, what we call a good neighbor philosophy. And that is how we treat our neighbors, which includes the environment around us. Cool. Um, I was interested in, um, you know, what you're saying about the McCurr, um project. You said that B2 did some quite good drilling, but then sort of dropped it. Um, and then you, you, did you buy it from B2? I mean, how, how did, uh, you know, why did B2 drop it? And how did you come to kind of benefit from that? So I think it was multiple things at the at the same time. It was it was partially more like a, a spin out and structure it was a completely uh, shared deal back in 2018. And I do believe it was they were hoping perhaps that it was a gold uh, copper porphyry and ended up being a copper molly porphyry. Uh, they're still in Colombia. They're actually right now developing the Gramalote open pit uh, gold mine. I just think it was that maybe there was in some interest in looking at copper porphyries and then wanted to maintain to their core uh, um, core of, of gold. Sure. OK, um, but you've got you've got three projects, um, all of which kind of look quite good. So how? Do you manage that in terms of messaging? You know, because you, you're talking about kind of three different things, and do you have a kind of a, a pecking order for those projects? Is where is is one of them more advanced than the other? I mean, how how and, and from a project management point of view, how do you kind of rank those projects? Um, and run well, I guess I have a a little bit. We have actually kept in the Americas and kept in a very similar time zone. I'm fluent in Spanish and English, which helps a lot too. Having really strong people on the ground, I wish I had more time to talk about the the management team that we have. But having people that are uh, have a high ability to execute on the ground helps dramatically. And we really believe at the stage of the projects right now that they all deserve getting a kick at the can and making sure that they start getting advanced and looking forward. And I think we're really watching for what marketing, uh, sorry, what the market says in terms of what's the higher interest is. And then there's obviously lots of optionalities on what we'll do in the future, uh, spin outs or looking at different options. Uh, my personal belief is that Makoa, the value of Makoa will be clearly demonstrable in a very near future with an existing uh, resource. But, you know, many times I end up this presentation talking about the three different projects and people go, well, it's pretty obvious what your flagship is. And it's a different answer almost every time. So there's a little bit in, in there for everybody, right? Uh, that Esperanza has, uh, you know, looks like a field of a soul or working in VC and, you know, just a traditional mining district um, or, or, or Columbia with a, you know, it's a 4 billion pound uh, pure copper play. It's uh, so it's a very significant project. So there's, there's for different reasons, there's each project is interesting for different people. Um, and, and what's your kind of um, view towards um, developing these projects? I mean, do you, are you looking to bring in earning partners at, at some point in the future? And if so, what's your strategy around that? Or are you looking to kind of run them up through the various feasibility studies, your stages yourself? So first I'll talk about the way we operate. And I am a mining engineer and my philosophy has always been act like you're going to build it no matter what, right? Because if you're acting like you're going to build it, you're going to de-risk it. And hopefully, and it's potentially somebody wants to 
construct it a whole lot more than you do. Um, but the idea is, is that we'll keep pushing everything forward as, and as we are thinking, like we, we have the ability, we have the people that have the experience developing projects all the way through feasibility or through the start of construction. Um, so we might as well just push them down that, that pipeline. And then we think that creates the most opportunities, whether, you know, it is feasible that we do it ourselves or somebody comes in as a JV partner, or we spin it out into like a very much like a Lumina type uh, opportunity where we taking each, get the assets to a point and then spin it out into a different uh, opportunity. Right now, we don't think we're looking for JV partners or any of them because we are capable of getting them all to the next stage, but doesn't mean uh, maybe a year down the line, we won't be looking at that option. I mean, if, if I were to buy your stock now, um, you know, what am I looking at over the next kind of 12 to 18 months? Is this really growth through the drill bits? Is it sort of a, a bet that, that, that the drilling is going to go well? Is that is that the investment case in the near term? I think in the very near term, we've drilled 10 holes on Big Red up in BC. We only have one of those holes in, so we expect more results to come out through now between the end of the year. And then the next big one is just, I do believe just restarting drilling on Makoa is, is huge news, right? For every pound of copper in the ground, it's worth 0.2 cents per pound. It's probably the lowest valuation uh, out, out there. So just that people recognize that this project is moving forward will create a, a huge amount of value. And then obviously the, the drilling that will come off the back of Makoa should, uh, could create some significant value for shareholders. And I mean, that's, that's an interesting point. I mean, in terms of value, how do you think you should be valued? Should it be as a percentage of, of copper kind of resources as they grow, grow in the ground? Is that how you look at yourselves or is it potential well, trade but, values or I mean, what, what, uh, by what matrix should I value this? Well, uh, I, unfortunately, I'm a mining engineer, so I like uh, easy numbers to crunch in because, you know, Makoa is where I'm putting the majority of my attention. That's the that's the matrix that I personally use. It doesn't mean that's ones that other people use. Right. Uh, but I do think it's a very one that's easy to point to that shows that we're very undervalued and just getting the Makoa project back up and running and showing how drill results should create a big uh, catalyst for, for value ca change in the company. Well, that's great. Ian. Thanks very much. I'll hand over to Justin if you uh... If you're interested, yeah, um, just are, you, are you now are you now back online? Are you able to yeah, uh, connect to us? I'm back on Wi-Fi. Can you hear me? We can hear you yes. perfectly now. Okay, fantastic. The power is back on. I'm back on Wi-Fi. Um, and, and sorry, I just had one other question for Ian. What's the what's the current cash position of the company, and where does that take you to in your in your current exploration programs from a catalyst perspective? We're actually doing a financing right now for five million that covers the expiration expenses for Makoa. Uh, we're actually underway right now on that financing, and that should cover Makoa for the entire year, plus local GNA and corporate GNA for an entire year. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I think that that was a really fantastic presentation, a great update. Would encourage our listeners to go and check out uh, um, the Barrow Copper and Gold. And um, I'd now like to move on to our next update, which is Serge Copper. And I briefly introduced him earlier. He is Leif Nielsen, their Chief Executive Officer. Prior to joining Serge Copper, uh, Leif dedicated 15 years to a career in mining advisory and investment banking for various can Canadian and international firms. Most recently, he was Senior Vice President at Macquarie Capital. Uh, Leif, we are very keen on learning more about Serge Copper. The floor is yours. Great, thanks, Andrew. And uh, I have, I think, tried to share a, uh, a slide from the presentation. Can you see that? I just want to confirm. Yep, we can see that. Perfect. So this uh, this image, I think, is a helpful uh, visual cue to get a, a very high level, few minute rundown on what we are doing. Uh, Surge is uh, it's a fairly simple story in that we're focused entirely in a single area in central British Columbia. Uh, we refer to this area as the Huckleberry District by virtue of the fact that there is a, uh, a mine that uh, our tenement package surrounds called the Huckleberry Mine. Uh, that mine is currently on care and maintenance. Its, uh, its owner, Imperial Metals, is uh, investigating, among other things in their business, the uh, possibility of uh, restarting this mine. Uh, it has a relatively short uh, reserve life, so part of the thesis that we're pursuing at Surge is looking at, um, you know, the overall scale of the endowment and opportunity uh, in this wider district. So uh, looking at the, the claim map there in the bottom of, of this slide, uh, it's probably hard to see all the writing on there, but um, 
uh, basically we've we've assembled this land package over the last uh, well we've made some certain you know transactions and moves over the last uh, year or so to significantly grow the land package. Surge as a company uh, owned the uh, the property to the south of Huckleberry for a number of years. That's referred to as the Utsa property. Uh, and since December of last year, we've um, we've done a handful of transactions and some direct staking to consolidate uh, that area to the to the west and northwest of Huckleberry. Uh, so that itself is divided into a, a couple different projects. So the black outline there is what we refer to as the Berg property. Uh, that is a a seventy percent uh, earn in agreement with uh, Centera Gold as the counterparty, uh, and then some of the other blue properties around there were. Uh, smaller deals that we did with uh, with private vendors to consolidate uh, some uh, you know pretty important areas um, geologically in that district. So lots of the blue stuff uh, in and around the Berg property is all 100% uh, owned by us. So uh, the big picture is that this is a district that has uh, a very large mineral endowment already. There's a bona fide porphyry cluster there, so you can see a, a bunch of stars on that map. So there's seven known porphyry deposits in this district. Uh, we control five of them. There's about um, uh, there's there's resources on um, on five deposits in the district, including Huckleberry, uh, and there's a huge exploration opportunity on top of that. So we we control uh, a number of deposits that have quite advanced resources, which are, are tabulated on the table there. So about 834 million tons of uh, of porphyry copper resources between a few different deposits, uh, and then we're also busy exploring uh, the wider district. So we commissioned a, uh, a ZTEM geophysical survey uh, in June of, of 2021. So we're in the, the stages right now of uh, working with the contractors there to, to process and interpret that data. Uh, that's going to be a, a pretty important uh, tool for us going forward next year to uh, run a number of different um, uh, earlier stage target testing uh, drill campaigns around the district. Uh, obviously hopeful of making uh, a new discovery, which we think there's uh, excellent chances for in this district. Uh, a lot of what we've been investing in over the course of uh, 2021 this year has been, uh, you know, more straightforward resource drilling at the uh, the Utsa project in particular. So at Utsa, it's a cluster of three deposits. The biggest one there is called West Seal, uh, and that the, the last resource done at West Seal is back in 2016. Uh, there was quite a lot of, um, you know, room room left there to expand that uh, deposit. So we've been completing around 44,000 meters of drilling uh, over the course of 2021. About 30,000 meters of that was into the, uh, the West Seal deposit, uh, basically trying to um, you know, target and fill in volumes that will ultimately have a good chance of making it into uh, an updated resource that we're working on uh, targeting release uh, before the end of the year. So I think that's a, a pretty simple high level summary. So we're in an area with fantastic infrastructure in central BC, uh, in particular by virtue of the, the fact that there's a mine right next to us, uh, big resources that uh, were, were you know, going down the path of advancing, uh, but also a very exciting greenfields generative um, exploration and discovery opportunity that we're uh, really turning our focus to in earnest uh, heading into next year. I'll kick off with the first question. Um, what are the timelines you project for Utsa to go into production? Yeah, so, so Utsa, uh, this is a project that had a PEA completed on it uh, back in 2016. Uh, it was a fairly unique study that looked at uh, utilizing the Huckleberry uh, mill on a tolling basis. Uh, and that was actually done prior to Huckleberry going on Cairn maintenance. So that project concept would, would ultimately uh, rely on or, or require the remaining you know five or six years of reserve life at Huckleberry being uh, depleted so I'd say uh, you know on the on the minimum uh, time scales that's that's sort of what we're looking at we're, we're obviously uh, in in the process of advancing these projects uh, looking at you know other standalone type uh, opportunities but it's it's earlier days there and uh, in the in the context of project timelines in BC uh, you know once you're once you're done with a feasibility study and enter the environmental assessment process, uh, we're not there yet, but uh, once you do, it can be a um, you know certainly a multi-year process. So uh, I wouldn't say in the in the base case we're looking at these as a you know, near-term production opportunity, but obviously given the fact that there's a um, a mine and mill on Cairn maintenance uh, right next door that provides a certain you know lens and and um, you know dynamic of optionality in the in the overall district in terms of uh, restarting production. 
Um, I'd like to bring in Justin from Denham Capital. Uh, what questions do you have, Justin? Sure. Um, Leif, and I apologize, I, I can't quite see the scale on the map, but I was curious, uh, just given the size of the ore bodies here and the fact that you're consolidating the district, um, and just noting that, that we are kind of dealing with lower grade uh, mineralization, is there an opportunity to, to ultimately build one processing plant and, and use that as a central location to feed ore from all these various deposits into? Yeah, I think it's certainly an opportunity and we're, uh, we are working on um, trying to uncover that opportunity. Uh, the Berg deposit is, is obviously the one that I think presents the most challenges in that regard. It's, it's you know, furthest away from the, the center of gravity. It's, um, it's a bit up in higher elevation, which is both a, uh, a challenge and an opportunity, an opportunity in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, if you're looking at conveying systems, you would be, um, you know, able to utilize gravity in some way just to get a sense of scale. So from the Berg deposit down to the, the seal deposits is about 28 kilometers. But from the Berg deposits to um, a, a pretty important area in this district, which is where the, um, the man-made reservoir body of water, which cuts through the middle there, gets to its narrowest point, which is about 150 meters across. That's about 16 kilometers and largely sort of uh, yeah, downhill, as I said, from the Berg deposit. So uh, it's not without its challenges to, um, to, to sort of look at the district from a central processing perspective, but uh, we are doing some work on that and prior operators who were you know, previous owners of Berg in the past have uh, have done some work on that as well. So uh, there's quite a lot of um, you know data and prior studies that we can leverage in that uh, in that regard. We're not we're not starting from scratch. I would say the concept of central processing between Huckleberry and the three deposits at Utsa is is much more straightforward. There's uh, much smaller distances involved there. Uh, and as as I said, the PEA that we completed in 2016, which I won't go into details summarizing in this forum, but um, it covers a lot of the specifics of, uh, of how that would be um, uh, completed. Okay. Fantastic. Thank and you. then from a, from a First Nations engagement perspective, are there, are there bands in and around your project that, that you're currently in dialogue with? Yeah, there are a, a number. So as is typical in, um, in BC and elsewhere in Canada, there's um, uh, uh, what we refer to as uh, overlapping title claims in this area. So as part of the uh, engagement process, which really starts to come to a head um, as, as part of the formal EA process at both the provincial and federal level, which again, we're not in right now, but uh, in advance of that, uh, you know, it's a very fundamentally important part of advancing these projects to maintain uh, pretty high levels of, of engagement and communication with uh, those stakeholders as you, um, as you begin to advance these sorts of projects. Uh, and uh, as, as Ian referred to uh, before, uh, th at their projects, a lot of it is about uh, understanding uh, and, and communicating with those communities about what matters to them, uh, but also as you go through these things, you know, providing regular um, uh, updates on activity and opportunities for both employment and, uh, and you know, business contractor type uh, uh, opportunities. Okay, great. Um, and then if I can just bring in Martin, uh, what questions do you have? Yeah, you know, some... Curious about your kind of exploration <clears throat> strategy. So um, we've got the kind of red stars, which are the porphyry deposits, and you've got kind of quite a few yellow dots, which are known prospects. Um, and you, you say you ran a VTEM survey um, in, in June. Um, yep. Did you run that over the whole property? And, and was that, um, you know, are you, st are you still hopeful you're finding more prospects or are you just focusing on the prospects? Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate the question because I think it's a big uh, kind of value component for the story. So uh, I'd point to a few things. So one of the red stars on the on the map is called Burgett. That's a pretty advanced target. It's got some drill confirmation, a bunch of overlapping data sets, including uh, some ground based as well as uh, airborne geophysics, not including what we just flew, uh, as well as a number of different um, soil surveys. We consolidated that land position uh, through a couple deals we did last year, so it, it's opened up the possibility or the prospect of drilling, uh, frankly, some of the, um, the, the most uh, high quality or, or attractive um, areas of that target. So that, that's one that's, um, I'd say, fairly mature from a, um, a greenfields exploration target perspective. A lot of the other yellow dots in the district uh, run the gamut from being uh, you know, lightly prospected in the sense of, uh, you know, rock chip samples, um, some soil surveys, 
uh, other geophysical anomalies, et cetera. So there's a bit more work that has to be done on a number of those to, to get them up to drill ready status. But uh, we do have a, basically at this stage, about a pipeline of a dozen uh, of these targets from the, the bottom end being those, you know, early stage recon type targets all the way to the top end being something like Burgett that we would, you know, characterize as being uh, drill ready. The, the concept of the, um, the the ZTEM survey, so it not not to be confused with VTEM. Nice. Was, uh, okay. ZTEM. So this is an airborne um, uh, electromagnetic survey. It, it, it's a, basically a clever way to map um, resistivity and conductivity. Uh, it works very well in these types of environments where there's a bit of um, you know rugged terrain, uh, and you've got a you, you already have a bona fide porphyry cluster. So you're looking, uh, you're quite interested in knowing um, structure. Uh, lithology and alteration down to, to big depths. So uh, ZTEM has the benefit of, of preserving pretty good resolution in the, in the near surface environment, as well as um, being able to image uh, those, those quantities or parameters down to about uh, a kilometer. So it's not, it's not quite like IP geophysics where you're um, in a sense directly measuring the presence of, uh, of sulfides, but um, you know, which, which would host the copper itself, but it can be um, you know, very, very useful tool to quickly map uh, a district this big to see where the relevant, uh, you know, structures and, um, uh, you know, alteration patterns uh, will be. And obviously, given the maturity of some of the deposits here, we, we expect to get kind of true positive signatures out of uh, a number of the existing deposits there. So to, to specifically answer your question, it's twofold. One is to, um, uh, I think, verify and um, you know get more confidence on that existing pipeline of a dozen targets. Uh, but we are are pretty hopeful that we're going to get brand new targets that come out of it as well. Uh, part of that is is really in the southern part of this district. There's um, a bit of soil cover. It's not very deep, but it's quite pervasive. The seal deposits themselves were blind discoveries by surge using ground-based geophysics. So there's abundant opportunity to make. Uh, similar types of discoveries in the district and, and obviously remote sensing techniques is the uh, is the sensible way to go about it. So we did that survey in uh, partnership with Imperial. So everything you see on that map there has uh, the same the same uh, geophysical data uh, collected across it uh, earlier this year. And we're we're in the process of um, uh, processing and interpreting that right now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm, oh, um, sorry. So I think Martin, we need to probably just move on because I, I, I cool. think just in the interest of time. So, apologies uh, if, if we can if like have time, I'll definitely come back to you for more questions for Leif uh, at the end. But that was a really fantastic uh, update, Leif, and thank you very much for that. Um, Cheers. Our next uh, and third mining update is from Adam Smith, uh, Vice President of Business Development of Oracle Resources. Um, Adam just uh, has a career of over 25 years in business and corporate finance and has been a consultant to Oraco since its formation in 2006 and is a co-founder of Ultimira Copper Corp. Um, Adam, would you like to give us an update about Oraco? Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Andrew. Just to confirm, uh, you can see my screen? You can see the first slide there? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Uh, and thanks to all of our hosts, uh, the Minds and Money team. I think you've, uh, you've put together a superb event here. Well run, thank you. I look forward to seeing you in person uh, first couple of days of next month in London. Uh, Rocco is a Vancouver-based company listed on the TSX Venture. We control the Santa Tomas Porphyry Copper Deposit located in coastal Northwest Mexico. Santa Tomas hosts a large, circa 950 million ton historical resource as estimated by Mintech in 1994, containing approximately 7.4 billion pounds of copper <clears throat> and copper equivalent uh, represented by gold, silver, and molly. The historical work at Santa Tomas was conducted using a valid database of greater than 300, sorry, 30,000 meters of drilling in over 90 core and RC holes by a competent team utilizing, utilizing methods that remain relevant today. And we believe that with confirmation drilling, that resource will be validated. <clears throat> Santa, so Tomas, Santa Tomas is the subject of a pre-feasibility study by Bateman Engineering published in 1994 that utilized this resource estimate as well as metallurgical test work by Mountain States Research and a positively scoped Santa Tomas for the production of approximately 125,000 tons of copper per annum in a clean 28 to 29% concentrate. That study identified no design risks and further concluded that the mineral resource at Santa Tomas is likely to increase in grade and tonnage with additional exploration. Following that PFS, copper prices dropped consistently over several years to reach century lows in real terms. 
Gold was deemed a relic, capital markets, interest in junior explorers evaporated, <clears throat> and work at Santa Tomas stopped. Following that, a nearly two decade legal title dispute was fought. We were asked by Santa Tomas's rightful owner to resolve the dispute. And over the course of a decade, we did, and finally resolved it in January of 2020, earning us a controlling interest in Santa Tomas. And that's how a deposit that reached this size that, uh, that was positively scoped in an advanced uh, economic study. 26 years later, um, work is only commencing now. <clears throat> that period of time gave us an opportunity to assemble surrounding properties. And today we control a 35 square kilometer package containing the historical resource together with all possible extensions. Following the Q1 2020 legal resolution, we commenced a large 3DIP survey at Santa Tomas covering approximately 14 square kilometers with resolution down to greater than 600 meters. That geophysical survey has successfully mapped resistivity and chargeability characteristics along a swath of approximately two kilometers by five kilometers along strike with chargeability remaining open to the north and at depth. The survey demonstrates a strong correlation with the chargeability features and the historical drill results, uh, as well as significant exploration potential lateral to the historical resource and at depth below the relatively shallow two to 300 meter historical holes. And in many cases to the limits of the survey's resolution at depth, as well as to the north of the survey area where resistivity remains open and chargeability remains open. IP anomalies extending from historical drill defined zones describe an area indicating a potential order of magnitude resource growth at Santa Tomas. Given this, and that most of the shallow historical holes ended in mineralization, we're very positive about the prospect of growing an already large resource at Santa Tomas. We're fully funded, having raised 25 million last year, and drilling commenced in late January of this year with two rigs focused on the north zone, where historical drilling was most detailed, and a third rig is supposed to start any day at the Brasile zone. The resource, uh, I should mention, in the slide in front of me here on the right hand side, that's the north zone. The north zone contains uh, a, at a 0.3 cutoff, uh, a shell of approximately, or a 0.3 grade shell cutoff, uh, approximately 333 million tons of about 0.5 equivalent within that larger, uh, close to billion ton resource identified by, uh, by Mintech. We're well funded, targeting a large historically defined resource with a strong likelihood of expansion and looking forward to a drill program that currently has two drills turning, we'll shortly have three drills turning, and we're hoping to ramp up to uh, four to five drills in the very near, near term. In this slide, you can see some of what's coming out of the ground. Uh, some, of that, uh, some of those depths indicated there are well below the depths historically drilled. We're very pleased with what we've seen in the first uh, nine holes so far, and looking forward to, uh, to starting to release the results uh, as the, the labs that are currently backed up quite a bit, as you know, um, start to release the uh, the assays to us. Excellent. Well, I think that would be a good time just to um, interject with some questions, I think, from our um, investor guests in the audience. Um, perhaps I can turn over to yourself first, Martin French. What questions do you have for uh, Adam? Yeah, Adam, I was kind of interested in the last point on your first slide. Um, you said a strong liquidity path, and then you spoke about the fact that there's yeah. Kind of a you know kind of a lot of global demand for you know good projects like this so so could you just expand a bit on that i mean is that a hint that you're looking to do a trade sell or partial trade sell um on this project or, or you know what's your strategy to well, think, provide um, value to shareholders yeah uh i think there's a long list of companies uh that have had assets like santa to mass they're they're all seeking they have all sought to to take those into production but Somewhere along the way, there's been an offer made by a, by a large operator that uh, that makes the most sense for that company. We will, of course, advance Santa Tomas uh, to production first with the drilling, uh, subsequently with uh, with engineering, permitting, et cetera, et cetera. But I would suspect, in in the current environment of uh, a paucity of assets, majors looking at pipelines that are that are relatively bare, um, that we and and others with assets like us will we will see offers. Uh, to take the company over or take the asset off the company. Uh, there was a study done in 2018 uh, by RFC Ambrian of London. Uh, encouraged people interested in the space to, to read it. A uh, superb study that, uh, that looked at historical M&A, that looked at available assets, uh, looked at the, um, the intentions of potential buyers. 
um, and paints a very strong picture of the, the liquidity path that companies like Santa or like Oroco uh, have in front of them. Okay, thanks. I'm, I'm bringing in Justin from Denham Capital. What questions do you have, Justin? Thanks, Andrew. Um, Adam, uh, thanks for the presentation. Sounds like a very interesting story. Um, what are your plans post drilling to, to update any economics on the project? Well, we've got we've got quite a bit of drilling ahead of us. Uh, I think it's a planned 133,000 meters at this point. Um, the asset, uh, the target is very large here. It's greater than five kilometers north to south. Um, we have eyes through the IP program down to 600, 800 uh, meters or more. Uh, so we know that even at a fairly wide spacing as appropriate for porphyry copper deposit, you've got a lot of drilling. Um, but as we as we advance the project, uh, as we as we generate compliant resources uh, in each of the three zones, uh, we will start to do those things that uh, constitute the pieces of a of a PEA or a PFS. Uh, and it is certainly our intention to take this forward uh, to that to that level. So uh, I would say we've got several more months of drilling before the first compliant resource uh, is uh, able to be estimated. And then after that, we would, um, well, concurrent with that, I would expect we'd be doing the metallurgical work uh, and putting all the other pieces together, like uh, water rights, surface rights, uh, engineering, geotechnical work, et cetera. So, so our goal is to take this first to a compliant resource in the, in the North Zone, uh, where it was drilled in most detail in the past and where a, a, a shell of uh, a fairly high grade material uh, exists uh, and an economic case can be made for a mine at Santa Damas as, as Engineering did in 1994, um, and then to advance uh, to take all those pieces and advance that to a, an economic study of some sort. Okay, and then I know in Mexico there's there's a fair bit of ver uh, variability state to state uh, as mm -hmm. far as you know security and, and stakeholder engagement. Uh, how have you found Sinaloa? Well, we we started operating in Mexico in 2006. Uh, we drilled, defined, and sold an asset that is still in production in Sonora State. So we're, we're very conscious of, of how to operate uh, in Northern Mexico. And in Sinaloa, it's, uh, you know, Sinaloa is obviously well known for, for the security situation, but our, our property actually physically straddles the Sinaloa Chihuahua border. Um, and it's surrounded by uh, existing and, and previously operating mines to the east of us uh, was El Cazal, operated by Gold Corp until it, uh, until it shut down. Um, to the northwest of us is the Piedras Verdes open pit copper mine operated by Invector Capital of Mexico City. Um, Arcelor Metal are in the region mining iron ore. So, so it, is a, it is a region of, of a lot of mining activity. Um, it's also a region called the La Entrada al Pacifico. It's a, a federal and, uh, and state initiative, uh, infrastructure and industry initiative um, containing a gas, high pressure gas pipeline from Texas, Chihuahua Pacific Railway, the port of Topolobampo, uh, and a number of other uh, industrial, large industrial infrastructure projects. So it is a region of, of heavily industrial activity and economic activity. Uh, but we are very conscious of, uh, of uh, working with the local community. Uh, the vast majority of our employees, even our technical staff, are, are locals. Uh, we've been conducting uh, community work since uh, well before we started exploration. We started community work five years ago. Um, so I think with all that uh, together, I think we're quite comfortable in, in the region, which is uh, relatively safe and stable and economically active. Um, so we're, we're, we're well aware of, uh, of the necessity of creating a safe environment there and, and working with the community. And uh, it, uh, it's been a success. Okay, there's, um, there's a question from Sam Katz uh, in the audience. Of course, assays will be much more informative, but just based on what the technical team has seen from drilling, date, from drilling to date, how, if at all, has the company's understanding of Santo Tomas's mineralization ore body from the historical drilling and 3D and and uh, 3D IP evolved. Yeah, thanks, Sam. That's a that's a good question. Uh, we have a terrific roadmap at Santa Tomas in the form of uh, 90 historical holes, uh, drilled by very competent parties and reported by Bateman Engineering um, and utilized by MinTech of Arizona uh, in a resource calculation. So we we've got a, a terrific roadmap. The 3 dip program showed a tremendous correlation between the historical drill results uh, and the IP results. 
uh, again, adding to, to the picture we have of Santa Mass. Um, we were very confident when we started drilling that we would, we would see results very much in line with the historical results. Uh, but of course, when that first drill hit the target at the expected depth, uh, there was a terrific uh, sigh of relief in the office. Um, we've drilled, of course, much deeper than, than the historical holes. And I think, uh, I think I'm comfortable saying that, uh, that the confirmation of the historical data has been, uh, has been a success. The deepening of those holes into zones that are indicated by the IP uh, to be um, containing sulfide mineralization, um, that has been a success as well. I think we've, we've managed to understand that the, the deposit uh, runs deeper than was historically drilled in these relatively shallow holes that we're looking for at the time, an oxide copper deposit. So we, we've expanded our understanding. We've confirmed the historical uh, in, uh, work and drill results in the holes to date. So um, Sam, I can tell you that, uh, that, that we're all quite pleased and, and looking forward to the next 100,000 meters that we complete at Santa Tomas and certainly looking forward to uh, drilling in Brazilis, which is an extension of and immediately north of the, of the North Zone. Um, where historical holes uh, exist. We only have anecdotal uh, evidence or uh, stories of, of the results of those holes, um, but those anecdotal stories are very interesting and, and drill, a drill will start turning at Brazilis very quickly. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that. And thank you very much for, the, for that question, Sam. So from one Sam to another, um, I'd, like, I'd now like to invite our uh, next mining update, who is Sam Lee, Chief Executive Officer of North Isle Copper and Gold. Over the last 20 years, Mr. Lee has advised on some of the most prominent M&A equity and debt transactions in the, international, in the international and Canadian global mining industry, totaling over 100 billion in value. Sam, why should we be investing in North Isle Copper and Gold? Thanks very much, Andrew. Well, the answer is simple. Uh, our strategy is to have a robust, large copper and gold project in production within that 10 year decade period that you've just uh, talked about where we will, uh, we're forecasted to see seven to 8 million ton deficit uh, in copper. Uh, we're gonna uh, aspire to do that with our North Island project, which is based in British Columbia. Um, it's approximately 22 year mine life as defined by PEA. Uh, and then concurrent with our development strategy, we are looking uh, at uh, identifying a truly a camp style play across our 50 kilometer porphyry district. There are seven uh, mineralized targets uh, within that 50 kilometer strike length, starting from BHP's Island Copper Mine, which was uh, in production for 24 years, which is that picture right in the bottom right hand insert. Um, and uh, there are two deposits, obviously, as identified by our PEA. Uh, and there are four targets uh, that is the focus of our exploration activity. Um, so that's the proposition and the strategy um, is to effectively be meaningful and material within this decade. So how are we going to do it? Well, our preliminary economic assessment that was issued in March um, boasted a long mine life of 22 years. As I mentioned, it's a copper gold dominant project, it's approximately 62% copper. Uh, and 35% gold, uh, large annual production of about 156 million pounds of copper equivalent over the life of mine. Uh, the attractive economics, uh, about approximately $1.1 billion after tax NPV at 8% at $3.25 copper and using 1650 gold uh, with nearly a 20% after tax IRR. Again, for a 22 year mine life, this is a very robust project. Uh, with a short payback of approximately 3.9 years. Um, what informs this project is approximately an infer in the inferred category, uh, 5 billion pounds of copper equivalent. If you want to think of this as a gold project, that's approximately 9.3 million ounces of gold equivalent in the inferred category, or sorry, excuse me, the indicated category, an additional 2.8 billion in the inferred, and an additional 5.5 uh, million uh, ounces uh, in the in inferred category. Um, so the idea here is obviously to rapidly and sustainably develop this. Uh, we believe that uh, we are able to do this, uh, given that we are in BC, we've got very um, identifiable uh, stage gates as it relates to our permitting uh, and developing um, uh, activities. 
Uh, we have the leadership uh, with over 200 years of financing and developing and operating these sorts of mines that span, you know, BHP, um, uh, SSR, Newmont, um, and, and the likes of these larger companies. So we are very confident that we have the capabilities to advance this uh, in, in short order. And then, as I said, uh, we've uh, focused a great deal of attention around our exploration activities uh, across the 50 kilometer porphyry district that we own 100%, starting with the 10,000 meter drill program that we're approximately a third of the way through. Uh, we're waiting for assays on the second uh, third, and then we're uh, looking to commence uh, the third, uh, last portion of that drill program uh, imminently. Okay. Um, thank you very much for that, uh, Sam. I'd like to now turn it over for questions. And perhaps I can go to yourself uh, first, Justin, what questions do you have for Sam? Sure, uh, Sam, I have two questions for you. Um, one, I see that you guys are gonna be starting a PFS in early 2022. Uh, who, uh, who are you gonna be engaging to do that work? Uh, we're currently in the process as, uh, uh, in identifying the, uh, uh, the engineering party that's going to help us with that work. Um, the P PEA was performed by M3, uh, the individual that internally that our QP uh, we used was Cam Brown, who's uh, been with us since our inception. Cam, as uh, many people know, uh, has been with uh, Dale Corman, our chairman and founder, um, uh, for many decades through Penasquito, developing Penasquito, and of course selling Penasquito to Glamis. Um, and he was ex Bechtel for 20 years, and he will also be assisting internally uh, the PFS moving forward. Okay, great. And, and then I had another question for you. Um, just given the large capital requirement here and the, the pretty significant uh, gold endowment in the deposit, uh, what's your view on streaming? And is that a, a tool uh, in your kit to ultimately get this project financed? Yeah, I think, look, I mean, I, it's, it's funny. I've been removed from investment banking from about, about two years now. And uh, the numbers that I'm seeing as it relates to uh, implied cost of capital, for streams and royalty um, is just beyond belief. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think I would have referenced in my past discussions with you that, you know, one could uh, expect a 5% cost of capital for near producing or producing uh, royalty or stream. Uh, that number has now gone to zero and sub zero, meaning that royalty and streamers are now paying premiums to NAVs in order to get their hands on good quality projects, obviously high margins and uh, strong gold content. So uh, I believe since the last time we've spoken, Justin, uh, that the market has just gotten even stronger for not only near producing or producing projects, but also um, reasonably early stage development projects. Fantastic, thanks, Sam. Thank you very much. Um, and first I can bring in uh, Martin. What questions do you have for Sam? Sure. I mean, um, it, it looks a great project. Um, and you've obviously got a lot of work ahead of you. Could you just sort of give us um, a view of what your kind of expenditure requirements are going to be over the next couple of years? And are you cashed up to to pay for all of that? Or are you yeah. going to be coming in and raising some more money? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Obviously, we're a junior company, so uh, we're going to be always constantly undercapitalized. But Justin actually brings up a really good point, which uh, is that because this project has so many levers, including just an absolutely enormous gold content, just to put the cold content uh, question into context, if we were to put a 100% stream on 100,000 ounces of gold production a year for 22 years, which is the length of our PEA, that's a $1.2 billion US stream. Uh, that's at a 5% cost of capital. So. Um, that's one lever. The other lever is obviously the fact that we have clean uh, copper and moly concentrate. Uh, how do I know that? Well, we're 25 kilometers away from the BHP Island Copper Mine. That's, <clears throat> that's, uh, this is essentially, as I mentioned before, just an extension of a 50 kilometer strike uh, length uh, trend that starts at that BHP Island Copper Mine. So our concentrates, copper, gold, are, uh, sorry, no, copper and moly rather, uh, are very low utilitarian elements and partnerships are available 
as it relates to trading these concentrates, off-taking smelting uh, concentrates. Obviously, equity is, a, is, is, is going to be a consideration uh, with a flow-through um, uh, market of being you know, extremely open and available to all Canadian participants. Uh, that's something that we can tap into. We did uh, a $10 million financing, uh, two tranche financing at the beginning of this year. Um, and uh, a good portion of that was done at a 40 plus percent premium to our trading price because we were able to access flow through. So at every single stage gate, we will access the right capital in order to go through each stage gate. Um, you know, we currently are financed for what we need to do today, which is um, essentially the initiation of our PFS baseline studies and metallurgical work. And then a, as I mentioned, a very robust exploration program that looks um, looks at 10,000 meters of drilling uh, this year. Thank you. Um, question I'd like to ask you, uh, uh, Sam, is uh, on your website and also on your news releases, you frequently talk about how North Isle Copper and Gold is a sustainable mining uh, company. Yeah. What does that mean in practice? Okay, well, in practice, part of it is in our control, part of it is not in our control. And part of it that's not in our control is the fact that we're in BC and we have access to clean, sustainable, renewable energy. So if anybody, any company is looking to become carbon neutral, net carbon zero by 2050, which is a wonderful aspiration to have, they need to have access to renewable energy. So BC is 100% renewable energy. As you can see in this map, Cape Scott Wind Farm is one of the largest, if not the largest, wind farm just to the north of our property in BC with 99 megawatts of power that can be potentially supplied directly to our project. They sell it into the grid right now, which ends up selling the extra capacity to California. Um, but in terms of the things that are in our control, we think that everything triangulates around First Nations. Uh, certainly uh, within our communities, we acknowledge and we absolutely respect the fact that this is their territory. We need to consult and, and be ensure that they have um, say early on, we're not gonna wait until the EIS in order to get their consultation on our project. And what we've heard thus far is very, very clear. One, they don't want this to be a 24 year mine. They want this to be a 50, 75, 100 year camp, right? Which obviously informs all of our exploration project. We want this to be effectively a starter for a multi-generational camp. The definition of sustainability is to sustain seven generations across. That's our objective here from at least an exploration perspective. Uh, and then in terms of reducing our size or at least reducing our footprint, there are multiple options because we are so close to the island copper mine, which is effectively the same size as a 700 million ton pit as uh, it's flooded right now, it's used as a neutralization pond. There's multiple options around use, utilizing that around you know, are potentially putting our tailings in there, uh, in addition to the fact that there is uh, the arguably the closest deep sea water port right on that um, uh, property, um, the closest deep sea water port from continental America to Japan, which is where obviously BHP sold their concentrate. So all of these things affect reducing this footprint, consulting and engaging with our First Nations group and ensuring that we have a multi-generational project uh, well into the future. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I think that brings us sort of near to the end of uh, the show. Um, I think the only thing that remains for me to do, apart from thanking the guests, is to, I'm not sure we've got a, a slide that we can have up on the screen to go and promote this, but all four mining companies will also be at our Minds and Money London uh, show in person uh, on the 1st or 2nd of December. First time in person for two years, so delighted that we are suddenly returning to uh, in-person events um, again. So really hope that you can go and join us. We'll also make sure that you're, you're sent details of that if you haven't been sent them already. We also have a drink for next week, um, Thursday the 18th of November, to which you're all invited. Um, all that remains for me to do is to go and thank our guests, who once again were Justin Matchin, Director of Denham Capital Management, Martin French from London Specialist Capital, Ian Harris from Libero Copper and Gold, Leif Nielsen from Surge Copper, Sam Lee of North Isle Copper and Gold, and Adam Smith of Oroco Resources. We, I hope that you all have a good evening and a good rest of the day. My name is Andrew Thake from Minds and Money. See you next time. Until then, stay safe. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, everybody.